Okay. Well, it looks like it's just me for answering questions today. Um, probably somebody will come along from the, the rest of the group of instructors, but that's fine. Everybody's busy. Um, so this is week four, um, just to give you a view of where we are. Let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. There we go. Just to give you a view of where we are in this process, here is the course plan. Week one, introduction. Week two, three, and now four for applications. And this basically rounds out the applications period. So we did systematic conservation planning, large-scale conservation and recovery projects, and public health applications. Um, and starting next week, we go into the tools. Um, so that's where we are. Now, let's, let's jump into some of these questions. Um, I'm not an expert in each of these fields. I'm probably strongest in the public health applications dimension. Um, if we have other instructors come along, then we can, we can do more, but uh, it is what it is. And uh, I know at least one of the people who presented for uh, this week um, is filling out answers to questions that were directed at him, and I will pass those on when he passes them to me. Um, okay, let's just go down through the list of questions. I have a few hundred questions, and I'm going to do less than that. Um, but this first one is very interesting, um, and it was asked by several people. And it's how do you see ENM approaches can contribute to understanding the distribution of the no, new coronavirus infection disease risk across the world? And refers to a, a map and data from Johns Hopkins. Um, so that's an interesting thing. Um, where these techniques are useful is where there is a relationship between environment and occurrence, uh, or where there could be a relationship between environment and occurrence. Um, most of, almost all of the transmission of this new coronavirus disease has been human to human uh, transfer. And there may be environmental modifiers, like maybe that doesn't happen under very arid conditions or very cold conditions. I don't know. But that's mainly a human to human phenomenon. And so I really would focus on what were the environmental circumstances under which it was transferred from the host, the long term host, which may well be a bat, um, from that host to a human. As far as we know, that happened only once. And this is the first time that this species has been encountered by humans. And so in that sense, um, we really have just one data point here. And I believe that was the situation with SARS as well. Um, I've done a, a, a fair amount of work in the past in situations like this um, with Ebola virus and Marburg virus, um, where, you know, for a long time we had very, very few, and, in, and for some of the species in that family, we still have very few occurrences. And so um, you can take very small numbers of um, occurrences and look for environmental signatures. Um, I'll, I'll put online a, a uh, paper with Ebola Marburg work that'll give you examples. But I think in this case, if the, the rumors and the, and the suspicions are true, in this case, I don't think it's going to work because where it seems like the 
transmission from host to human took place was in a wildlife market in Wuhan. And God only knows from where the host was brought to that market, but it probably wasn't free living in that market. So I think there just may not be any trace left of the signature. Um, I think that using niche modeling approaches for this species or for SARS or for any other such uh, very rare uh, virus that's probably very difficult to transfer to humans, uh, I think that's going to have to await um, more data. And so if I were investing time and, and resources in this, what I would be doing is testing a lot of bats to see which bat species hold this coronavirus, this particular species of coronavirus. And that would mean, um, that would mean finding a way to survey across large numbers of species and probably large numbers of individuals of each species so that you see, you know, first of all, is this a host specific or host generalist virus and then you know what is its prevalence and how does that prevalence vary over geography so i think there's a ton of work to do with coronaviruses um, and since the sars outbreak there's been a ton of work done that has shown coronaviruses in lots of uh, bats and i think other mammals and and i don't know about other vertebrates uh, but I think there's going to be a lot of work have to be done before uh, one can do any uh, modeling. Okay. Um, I'm going to just kind of cruise down through these questions. I highlighted a few. Um, here's a fairly general question about, um, about these... Um, applications to public health. Um, and a lot of this is, is this possible? Is this possible? Well, it's possible to explore these questions and some of them will be tractable and the niche modeling will be useful and some of them won't. Um, the, you know, this, let's look at the first question here on line 759. Is it possible to model the ecological niche of a bacterium that has special, several potential vectors and whose vectors do not have the same ecologies? Well, yes. Um, what are the pieces of this, um, of this picture? Well, you'd want to know presences of the pathogen. And for the example of Mycobacterium ulcerans, there's not a lot of independent detections of the, of the uh, bacterium. Um, but there are even fewer detections of uh, vectors because some of, some of that particular um, bacterium's transmission appears to be environmental, but it's very poorly known. Anyhow, more generally, one could assemble information on the pathogen and on the distributions and ecologies of the, the other species involved call them vectors, call them hosts. Um, and then one could assemble those different ecologies into a simulation uh, where you weight different pathways of transmission. It's not easy, uh, but it's quite doable. Um, I'm going to see if I can include a copy of a book that I wrote in 2014. Um, that talks about this sort of work. Uh, it's essentially a fairly general treatment of how you would approach disease risk mapping. So um, maybe that will be helpful to you. So notice that I'm skipping over questions that don't really speak to the the presentations of the particular week. 
Um, and I'm sorry for everybody who's, who's uh, or to everyone wh whose questions I'm skipping. Um, and I'm gonna skip over things like mechanistic models. We're gonna come back to that. Okay, so here's a question. Sounds like um, Raphael's um, presentation about systematic conservation planning was inspiring. Uh, will we have a better explanation of zonation, KDE, and marble uh, at some time in the course? Well, no. Um, which is to say, uh, those are separate platforms. And what we wanted to do was to show how um, ENMs, niche models, and distributional estimates that derive from them could be folded into platforms like zonation uh, for systematic conservation planning. Which is to say, in many cases, you'll have um, you have a, a, a platform of analysis like um, like these optimization routines for for prioritizing places. But the question is, what do you fit in? What do you uh, feed into those algorithms? Um, you could just feed in the occurrence points. But the occurrence points are a mixture of where the species is, but also where humans go and sample the species. And many times those are the most accessible places, and they might easily not be the best places to do conservation work. And so that's where the niche modeling comes in to um, essentially interpolate and, and, and um, extend the distributional information a little more broadly beyond just where we definitely have records of the species. So again, this course is about the niche modeling side. It's about um, the question of how can we best describe the distribution of a species synthetically and predictively and then some of that information can be fed into the systematic conservation planning um, algorithms. Looks like I'm not alone anymore. Hi, Mona. Hi, Town. I'm Great sorry. I'm you. coming back from uh, breakfast with a speaker <laughs> that took longer than I expected. Uh, those breakfasts always take longer than expected. <laughs> um, so, Mona, welcome. Um, I am here with. Nobody else. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so it's you and me. Probably somebody else will show up a little bit later. Okay. Uh, but I've been just kind of cruising down through the questions for this week. Okay. Uh, and so if you have particular questions you want to answer or you want the two of us to answer, just give me the line number and I will I'll move to there because I'm sharing the screen. Uh, and otherwise, I'm just going to keep going down and, and um, answering the ones that look interesting and relevant. Okay. Okay, here's a nice one. Um, this question is for Rafael Loyola about sy uh, systematic conservation planning. He talks about uncertainties, and I understand the reason why uncertainty is taken into account but I don't understand how it's incorporated into the ENM. In other words, I don't, I don't know how you can associate uncertainties to the model and how you can map it. Good question. Um, and in fact, uncertainty is not something that's handled very, very well and very, very rigorously in ENM so far in its development. Um, my very general answer to you would be that we can look at various factors that might create non-reality or non-biological variation in our model outputs. So for example, 
I might have 100 points available to me for a particular species. What if I had 50 more or 50 fewer? Or what if I had a different 100? Well, those points are going to affect what the, what the resulting map looks like. So we can pretty easily do a, um, a resampling or a subsampling of our available points and create 10 or 100 or 10,000 replicate sets of points. Maybe it's uh, sets of 50 taken from those 100 points that I might have available for a particular species. And in that case, I can run lots of models of those subsets of the points. And I can compare the outputs of those different models. There will be places that are always within the prediction, within the suitable area, no matter which subset of the points was used to create the model. And there'll be other places that for some subsets are included and for some subsets are not. And those are ones where maybe we ought to accord some uncertainty to those areas. We can do the same thing with different modeling algorithms, Maxent versus general linear models versus general additive models, et cetera, et cetera. If one algorithm says yes and another algorithm says no about a certain area, then maybe we should view that suitability in that place with some doubt. And so pretty typically what we do these days is um, we create a lot of replicate models um, under a bunch of different assumption sets. And then we see which areas are consistently identified as suitable and which areas are not. And uh, we can use those, those uh, essentially consistency maps or agreement maps. We can use that as a measure of uncertainty. Mona, any thoughts or any particular questions you want to look at? Well, uh, I missed everything <laughs> in this uh, course so far uh, because of my, my uh, hectic beginning of the semester. So I don't know in what context the uh, uncertainty issue was or topic was brought up. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, it, we have to consider uncertainty related to occurrence data, you know, to uh, environmental data. So yeah, it is, a, it is a very big, big topic of conversation. Um, and that's a, that's a good point. The uncertainty can come from things that we do as we are modeling, but it also can come from the things that we put into our models. So mm -hmm. certainly the occurrence data are the product of a weird and poorly understood sampling process. And also the, um, the environmental data have their own uncertainties. And that's something that we very rarely consider or people in this field very rarely consider. Um, if you go to the, the, the WorldClim data set, which is by far the most broadly used one, uh, in the methods description for that data set, there are maps of densities of, um, of occurrence points. I think I can get to one pretty easily. Let's see. Oh, the, you're to the meteorological the, state? Yeah, there are maps of the, um, the weather station data that were used to create these maps. Oh, damn. Uh-oh. Let's see, where are the methods? Okay, everything's moved around. Let me try again. What you can see when you look at these maps, look at that. Beautiful density for Eastern US, Mexico, Eastern Brazil, parts of Northwestern South America, India, 
Australia, East Africa, but then look right next door to each of those regions and you see huge holes in terms of the availability of weather station data. I mean, look at Greenland, look at the Tibetan Plateau, the Qinghai Plateau, look at the Arabian Peninsula. When we see those big gaps, what we are saying is that the interpolation that creates those nice raster maps of climate across the whole terrestrial Earth's surface those interpolation procedures have to fill in a huge gap with no information, okay? That's very dangerous to, um, to extrapolate so broadly across such huge areas. And so there is certainly a lot of uncertainty or a lot of error in these environmental coverages that uh, we don't take into account as much as we should. Um, we'll talk about environmental data later in the course, and you'll, you'll get some very useful summaries of that from different instructors. Now I've lost my, there it is. Well, Okay, so here's one that's kind of a generic question. Uh, which type of environmental data is needed to build distribution model of inve infective diseases? Well, it, it could be any sorts of environmental data depending on the, the particular disease. Um, it could be maps of human geography. If you have um, the ability to map them continuously across space, and if you have occurrence data that, that correspond to those environmental data in time and space, could be climate, could be lots of things. Um, later on, lower down in the list of questions, I think I marked it, there was a question that I found kind of provocative. Um, and I wanted to answer it. Let me see if I can find it. Ah, there we go. Here's a really good one. Um, I don't really agree with the question, but it's, it's an interesting one. This question is related to the application of ENMs in public health, specifically vector-borne diseases. It has been published and is widely acknowledged that world CLIM derived variables do not have an ecological meaning for tick ecology. Well, I, I'm gonna disagree with that, especially because then the, the person asking this question, speaking about mosquitoes says, it's known that the presence of these vectors is associated with microenvironmental factors such as presence of garbage. Yeah, but, we're talking about different scales, different extents. Those same mosquitoes that depend crucially in their local distribution on you know, discarded tires and containers with, with stinky water because they like uh, laying eggs in that sort of uh, situation, those same mosquito species have limits that relate to climate. They're gonna be far broader and they're gonna be manifested on coarse um, resolutions, not on fine resolutions. So there may be a part of the earth that is perfectly suitable climate wise, but has none of that, that uh, those micro environmental factors like containers with stinky water. Uh, and the species is not gonna be there but the suitability for the species in climatic terms is there. By the same token, you could have just the perfect, perfect pile of garbage with wonderful tires and brown smelly water and just, you know, every, every container breeding mosquito's dream and the wrong climate regime 
the species is not going to be there. So please think on multiple scales. Um, I don't know where it has been published or widely acknowledged that world CLIM derived variables do not have an ecological meaning for ticks. I think that is an error of scale in thinking. Um, I'd probably agree that world CLIM is not the best summary of global climate that is available currently. Uh, we'll talk about that later in the course. Um, but I don't think that it is correct to say that world CLIM or climate variables in general on course resolutions don't have an ecological meaning for ticks. Yeah, this is a surprising statement that world clean variables don't have an ecological meaning for tick ecology because I mean ticks are part of uh, an ecosystem, right? So ticks require certain types of vegetation, I'm assuming. I'm not a disease ecologist, but I, I'm assuming um, they do that the micro environments um, for ticks have to do with vegetation and vegetation has to do with uh, climatic conditions too. So yeah, it's an, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's not thinking about the scale that the multi-scale, um, the dimensionality <laughs> uh, problem of, of this statement. So in defense of this question, um, in a paper that, that Ram Raghavan and I are, are, are have submitted for publication and we just got reviews back, we had exactly the same criticism leveled at us about using climate data for tick ecology. So oh, I don't doubt that that belief is out there in the tick ecology world. I just dispute that the people who hold to the idea that climate is irrelevant to ticks, they're just not thinking on the right scale. Mm -hmm. Climate is important and substrate is important. And you have to think about both scales to get the right answer. Okay, there are some questions that kind of go beyond the point of, of this course. You know, besides niche models, what are the most important factors for conservation plans for critically endangered species? Well, for a critically endangered species, it may not be a question of suitability. It may be simply a, a question of numbers or of substrate, um, which is to say if, if there are you know, five individuals left of a particular rhinoceros, you might just have to focus on preventing poaching. Or if, um, if a, a particular species is critically endangered because the last patch of its forest um, is being cut, then that has nothing to do with what a niche model can, can tell you. It simply has to do with, um, with preserving that bit of habitat. Now, that said, the niche models for a, a species that appears to have just, I don't know, one occurrence point left it in the world, one population left in the world, um, that species, maybe you could use a niche model to find other candidate places where other populations might exist. Or maybe you could use a niche model to even find better protected places to which that species could be translocated. Okay, so there are possible uses, but we don't have to use niche models for everything in these fields. It's one more tool in your toolkit, and it allows you to get at the potential geography of species. Nothing more, nothing less. Mona, tell me if you see things you'd like to answer. Otherwise, I'll just cruise around. Yes, please cruise around. <laughs> The, the, the question, the critically endangered species question, um, you know, when we, when we go from models to an actual conservation plan, there are so many more factors to consider. 
land ownership, for example. Uh, yeah, it's um, model, niche models are, like you said, one piece of the puzzle. Uh, the real world is uh, quite complex <laughs> when it comes to trying to implement a conservation plan. Definitely. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, as Luis Escobar said, uh, the spatial distribution of the parasite is included in that of the host. That's true for, for host-specific parasites. The, question, the person goes on, this is really interesting, and I would then like to know how we can deal with the cases where a given parasitic, parasite has many hosts. Um, Bruley ulcer might be a, an example. Well, as I said earlier, you can develop um, simulations and um, essentially um, mechanistic summaries of disease transmission where you would essentially use niche modeling to create the, the geography of each of the species that participates. But then you might set up simulations to explore how those different species might interact and what those interactions might mean for the transmission of the disease. Uh, but a, a really interesting question uh, that I don't think has been asked, well, at all, I know it hasn't been asked at all frequently, uh, and I think it should be asked more frequently. But when we have a parasite that has a single host, is the parasite's world simply that host? Or is there some set of external influences? It might be climate, it might be other external influences that limit the distribution of the parasite to a subset of the host populations. Which is to say, if you had data on the environmental landscape, so maybe climate data, if you had data on the host and its distribution, and you had data on the obligate parasite, you can very easily build an ecological niche model for the host. And then you could ask, given how the host was sampled to detect this parasite, is the distribution of the parasite random with respect to environments within the distribution of the host. And those are really fascinating questions that can get at how much is the parasite distribution simply a consequence of the host distribution. Actually, is there a separate niche of the parasite within the distribution of the host? Here's an interesting one. Is there any situation in which niche modeling is not suitable to establish protected areas for conservation? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, most niche models are developed using climate variables. And so just knowing, I mean, let's take Rafael's examples of the Atlantic forest or the Cercado in Brazil, um, just knowing that the climate is right, if the forest has been cut, then yeah, you could do conservation work there, but it's gonna be a long-term restoration effort and not an immediate conservation effort. Um, the niche models have to be taken for what they are. They are a prediction of suitability of places based on environmental signatures, but with those environments defined in a particular set of dimensions. And if you don't have all of the crucial dimensions included in that, in that environmental universe, then you're not gonna get the whole answer and it might not be sufficient to establish protected areas. It's only one part of it.
Here's another one. Um, according to niche truncation under climate change conditions, um, how does the adaptation of the species to new environmental conditions affect or counteract the niche contraction? Could we include this adaptation in the ecological niche models? So first of all, a little bit of terminology. The niche doesn't contract necessarily. Rather, it's the spatial footprint of the niche, which is to say, an ecological niche is manifested in environmental space, and we have a fair amount of empirical data that suggests that those niches are quite stable through time. Um, but if at present, given that ecological niche, the species has suitable and accessible to it, let's say 100,000 square kilometers, but by 2050, maybe it'll only have 50,000 square kilometers. It's the same niche. The niche has not contracted. What contracted is its manifestation in geographic space. But that's, that's a terminology thing. I just want to emphasize to the trainees that you need to be certain to um, I need that it needs to, you need to be certain to keep the terminology correct and uh, distinguish between niches and things that are manifested in environmental space versus distributions and things that are manifested in geographic space. Uh, now, can we include this adaptation in the niche models? Well, yeah, I mean, you can go into environmental space and kind of experimentally modify which environments are classified as suitable versus unsuitable. It's not something that is prepackaged and easy to do, but you can do it. Um, and that sort of exploration is gonna be really interesting because it would, it would get at the question of, if there were to be genetic variation for certain dimensions of the ecological niche, could the species respond evolutionarily to these change processes like climate change? Uh, there's been some very nice um, recent work by uh, Alexandre Diniz Filio in, in Brazil um, on evolutionary rescue. And it's, a, it's speaking about exactly this essentially of the distributional area that is projected to be lost if a niche is conserved then what is the potential for not losing those areas if the species can adapt to the changing conditions now i'll put all of these bits of literature that i've mentioned I will put in the, the materials packet um, for you to download. And we'll just hope that um, none of the publishers ever, ever figures out that I'm putting those online. Mona, any thoughts, any, anything interesting, comments? Um, well, I saw when you, were, you uh, answered the question about multi Hosts, um, there's a uh, mulling parasites that have uh, multiple hosts. There was a qu question like two lines down, maybe. Let's two see rows if I down. can find that question again. Uh, it was posted 2 5 2020 at 804. At 804? 80, sorry, that. Yes, 808. Okay. Uh, and so I looked at that and there's a, the second, the one next uh, below it, uh, it looks like there was, there were discussions about um, climate change scenarios in the, in this um, course. Um, and I don't know if, I mean, the first one, is there a way to take into account or model the effect of global change in the distribution of disease? That's, <laughs> that's a, a 
case of uh, transferring the models on uh, uh, future climates or, or um, forecasts of uh, climates. So I don't know if that was discussed already. It looks like because the second, the next question talks about future scenarios. So do we want to <laughs> um, discuss these two questions or leave them for later when we... We, we can. Um, you know, Enrique Martinez Mayer presented on how we can transfer ecological niche models to future um, climate, climate scenarios. Mm -hmm. And Luis Escobar talked about how we can uh, apply these tools to disease distributions. So maybe this is a, um, a question of, of the person asking the question linking two different parts of the course. Okay. Uh, but also it may come down to um, let's not think about diseases as being anything very different from any other species distribution. Um, a pathogen is one more species on the face of the earth. It just happens to make humans unhappy or animals <laughs> unhappy. And so we shouldn't treat them as differently. You know, a tick responds to climate at coarse scales uh, and substrate at fine scales. And um, a pathogen that causes, let's say, Lyme disease responds to its external environment. Now, maybe its external environment is the gut of the tick that it's sitting in. Or maybe it's exposed to the external environment in a broader scale sense. Those are empirical <laughs> questions that we can ask. Okay? So... Um, I think that's a matter of the, the trainees kind of thinking about, um, thinking synthetically about all the different things that we're talking about in this course. Um, let's look at the, this next set of questions on line 818. Um, let's see, when we identify it, and in future scenarios, there'll be changes the appropriate area of a species, is, is it advisable to use the translocation of the species from a location with less suitability to another location with greater suitability of habitat in future scenarios? That's a really good question. And maybe that is going to depend chiefly on which species. There are some species that have great dispersal abilities and if there's better, uh, a better place that's more suitable for that species, um, they can find it and colonize it. And then there are other species that are pretty limited as far as their dispersal ability. And even if new areas open up that are going to be uh, much better for the species, they may not be able to detect them and colonize them and establish populations there. So, um, yeah, you could translocate them. You could, you could essentially artificially help them with the dispersal. Um, but those are all questions where you have to know a lot more about the natural history of the species. So the second part of that question comes back to the substrate versus broader, um, broader course resident <coughs> conditions. Uh, again, those, you know, insect vectors, yeah, of course, their local distributions are, are a, a consequence or, or a, a function of um, sanitation and, and substrate. But their broader scale distribution, I guarantee you, is a, a function of abiotic factors. Um, let's take Aedes aegypti, which is a big, big, big problem as a disease vector across the Neotropics, well, across much of the, the tropical world. But 
here on this side of the world, they are all across the tropics. And where Mona lives, I believe they have Aedes aegypti yes. because Tennessee is slightly more subtropical than Kansas is. But in Kansas, we have Aedes albopictus, but we do not have Aedes aegypti. We have the same uh, sanitation or lack of sanitation, which is to say Knoxville, Tennessee has nice pretty neighborhoods and crummy neighborhoods with garbage behind the houses. And so does Lawrence, Kansas. And Aedes aegypti has wonderful dispersal abilities, but it hasn't been able to colonize this far north or this far west. North meaning colder and more seasonal, and west probably meaning somewhat drier. And you know, maybe with global climate change, Aedes albopictus, sorry, Aedes aegypti will be able to colonize this far north and west. But right now we don't have it. And that's not a function of, of substrate. It's a function of those coarser resolution uh, abiotic variables that are fulfilled or not um, in a particular case or a particular place. We're kind of running out of time because I have to teach another class. I actually have to teach at the University of Kansas every so often. <laughs> so I think we'll, we'll cut it off today and for today, unless you have some last comment, Mona? No. no. <laughs> okay, well, Mona, thanks very much for showing up and, and lending a hand. And uh, participants, uh, There'll be another set of this time just two videos uh, online as of Monday. It'll be me with a very simple, very short talk about the basic toolkit for uh, niche modeling. And then uh, a group from, from Brazil talking about um, one very nice tool for uh, quality controlling occurrence data sets. That's implemented in R and get, believe it or not, it has a, uh, an exercise. So get ready to use your R skills to, uh, to try to solve a challenge. So thanks again, Mona, and- Thank you. Time. Yes, <laughs> bye. Bye-bye.